Welcome to Real Vision. It's Friday, November 6, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington, joined shortly by our managing editor, Ed Harrison. But first, with today's stories, Hallie Drazen. Hi, Ash. Well, it's the first Friday in November, and we have the latest jobs report. The Labor Department released the October jobs report today, and nearly half of the 22 million U.S. jobs that were lost during the coronavirus pandemic have now been recovered. The U.S. economy added 638,000 jobs in October, exceeding estimates. This is good news. The unemployment rate fell to 6.9 percent from 7.9 percent in September. This drop was more than expected. The gains were really driven by industries hit hardest by the COVID-19 crisis, like leisure and hospitality, which added around 270,000 jobs. The markets responded pretty well to the jobs report. Bonds responded by selling off. Equities saw mild declines, taking a breather coming off a four-day rally post-election. The Dow and S&P 500 are on track for about a 7% gain this week. So the jobs report is good, but it doesn't mean the trajectory of the recovery is set in stone, especially now as we head into fall, winter months and more coronavirus cases. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell noted Thursday that the economy recovered more quickly than had initially been forecast. But once again, he called on Congress and the president to do more to help with the economy. The Fed will likely keep its short-term interest rates near zero for a longer period of time in order to offset the lack of government spending around a stimulus package. When it comes to the U.S. presidential election, whether there will be a peaceful transfer of power to keep the markets calm and stable is still to be determined. Votes are still being counted at the time of this recording, and the nation is pretty much in the dark about who the next president will be. But of course, it's looking more likely like a divided government, which we had reported yesterday. Markets have historically had higher gains with the Democratic president and a Republican Senate. But whoever takes the White House, still has their work cut out for them. The speed and the size of a stimulus package is key to bringing the jobs market back to pre-pandemic levels. So there is momentum, but we'll see how long it takes and what comes out of it. Back to you, Ash. Ed, welcome back. Yeah, good to end the week with you, Ash. It's good to end the week with you as well. We've got one hell of a week to wrap. We do, you know, from a political perspective, definitely one hell of a week. But as usual, we're going to try to stay away from the politics and uh, hew more towards the data uh, and also, um, you know, economic data and market data. Yes, very much. Ed, where do you want to start? Yeah, I, I, I want to start actually with the markets uh, because there there were two narratives that were going on this week. I think one was, and I talked to Jay Pulaski about this yesterday, by the way. Um, one narrative is is that the markets were up uh, for the for two or three days after the election because of uh, the fact that we had a divided government and, and whatever outcome uh, people were looking at would be good for the markets o- over the long term. The second um, narrative is is that people have priced in a lot of chaos uh, and that chaos really hasn't come to fruition. And so markets rallied on the concept that, Really, you know, from a volatility perspective, there wasn't going to be a high volatility event. And so the VIX went down, uh, shares went up. And those were the two dueling narratives. And to me, even now at the end of the week, it's not clear to me if either of them makes sense. I think it's very difficult to say that, uh, and I'm not a trader, uh, I'm more of an investor that you know certain events in the in the real world are having an impact on markets this is why markets are moving for this reason and right. so as a result um i'm i'm still skeptical uh as to whether those are actually the real reasons that the markets have had the moves that they've had yeah let's go through the numbers real quick it's basically flat on the day here the dow uh closes at uh, 28323 uh, 0.24 negative on the day, virtually nothing there. S&P settles 3509 minus uh, 0.3%. Again, just about nothing. NASDAQ plus 0.4%. Uh, 
uh, settling at eleven eight ninety five. Yeah, you know, uh, let me give a shout out, by the way, to uh, uh, Tony Greer, because he's uh, one of the traders that we have on. Ne when he comes on next week, I think it'll be interesting to see what he has to say about, uh, you know, the narratives that he's taking away and how he's positioned now that we've had uh, the market action that we've had. But, you know, I'm looking at a lot of these weekly charts uh, yeah. to see uh, and not not the, the, the charts for the actual day, but, you know, what's happened over the last week. So if you look at a chart of gold, uh, mm -hmm. gold is is way up over the last week. Uh, it, it seems that gold was pretty much straight up throughout the entire week. I'm looking at a WTI chart, and again, WTI was up uh, through midweek, through the the fourth, and then it sort of uh, on, on the back half of the week uh, took a, a spin back. But really, overall, it, it was a positive week for WTI. Then, if you look at uh, the indices. All of them uh, were up through yesterday, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and they were flatlined today, as you were you said, with the NASDAQ slightly up. Overall, then, it's like a, a buy everything rally for the most part. Even yeah. treasuries were up on the week. So this week has been one where the everything rally is back in place, at least for this week. Yeah, it looks like for the end, I just did the calculation here. Uh, it looks like for the weekend, S&P up 7.34%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 6.88%. The Russell 2000 up 6.89%. And the big winner on the week, the NASDAQ, up 9.02%. On the bond market, to your point, uh, UST 10-year yield uh, minus 4%. Uh, change in yield uh, on a on a yield basis uh, for the week, so price is rising. Yeah, so I mean, uh, what's the takeaway from all of that? Uh, as a bond uh, investor, I would say the takeaway is that uh, people are they they don't think that uh, inflation is going to be a big problem, uh, that yields are going to stay low, but it, it's hard to say. Uh, when you look across uh, the world, when you look not just at the U.S., but, you know, let's look at uh, I have on my screen the German 10 year German bonds, which is trading at minus 62 basis points right now. You know, how is that done over this uh, over this past week? Uh, let me take a look and see the the bond over the past week is uh, relatively flat. So. You know, I think the long story short of uh, where we are is it's indeterminate as to whether or not uh, there there is any action to be had. Uh, if you look at the bunt in particular, which I think is more of a proxy of what's happening globally, because, you know, the shutdowns are where Europe was. The bunt went from minus 52 basis points at the beginning of October, you know, around October the 7th to where it is now, which is uh, minus uh more like minus uh, 62 basis points. So 10 basis points of, of change for bonds, which is telling you that at the margin, people believe that the economy is going to slow. So I think the markets, uh, the bond markets are basically telling us that the markets, uh, that the economy is not going to go gangbusters uh, and equities uh, may have some sort of technical factors involved as to why uh, they're rallying. Yeah. And with all that said, we always like to look at things on different time horizons. On the day, yields back up uh, on the 10-year. So higher, uh, higher yields, lower prices, uh, the expectation potentially of a Biden victory uh, and additional fiscal stimulus with uh, the potential uh, to drive down the value of the currency uh, and making the bond uh, a less appealing long-term instrument, so the thinking goes. So yeah, I, I think um, uh, it's still out uh, indeterminate as to where we are. But I, for me, you know, uh, it's the 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 month of rally in bunts that I would say says that at the margin, uh, what the market is seeing is that. Uh, the shutdowns in Europe are going to be negative for global growth, and it's a push since that period of time for bunts and and in general. So I wouldn't make too much out of the moves in the equity markets uh, from a fundamental perspective, and we'll just have to see how it plays out over the next uh, over the coming weeks. But let's look at the data, the U.S. data, uh, right. 
over the last week to talk about how that is. I mean, if I could give a macro view and w the weekend review, I would say actually the, the data are good. You know, the numbers uh, by and large, there were more beats than there were uh, things down. So I can go through, uh, you know, line by line with you, the, the, the data points that I think are the most yeah. important over the last week. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask you, Ed. For people who may have uh, not seen other shows during the week where we talked about this, what is your overall uh, view of that? And if you could, on a on a line by line basis, go through those data points for us and help us understand how you see things. Yeah. So let's uh, let's look at Monday. The big thing that came out on Monday was the ISM manufacturing report for October that came in uh, for uh, fifty nine point three versus fifty five eight expected. Uh, 55.4 prior. So prior uh, was lower than forecast, which was lower than the actual. That that was a big number, huge beat. So what it says is, is that there's still a decent amount of acceleration in manufacturing. What mm -hmm. I would say is if you think about the V-shaped recovery uh, motive, you really need to get numbers into the upper 60s and 70s to really think V. Uh, so what a 59.3 is telling you, you're at the upper range of a reverse radical. So we went de straight down, we came up, and now we're, uh, we're in that period where the kink in the, uh, in the growth rates of the economy is slightly lower than it was during the initial reopening period. But still, expectations are lower than the actual numbers. That's what the, the ISM is saying in terms of the manufacturing for Monday. So that was the big report for that day. Yeah, uh, the the next report. I don't think that there was anything that that was really that interesting uh, for a Tuesday. There was the total vehicle sales, uh, which came in a little bit light at sixteen two versus sixteen five. But uh, I don't. That's really as interesting. I think that Wednesday's report, the ADP report, was the really interesting one because the seven forty nine prior figure uh, went down to six fifty in terms of the forecast, but the actual came in at 365. So that was a really, really bad number, 365. Yeah. And if you look at uh, you know how many jobs we need, it would take you probably three years to f to backfill those jobs at that, l that pace. So that was the number that ha you saw the, the markets rallying, the bond markets rallying on. Uh, so uh, the real question for the back half of the week is, uh, is is that number real or is that an aberration? What are your thoughts there? And how do you think about it for people who aren't familiar with the economic data the way you are? Yeah, so my thinking is, is what we're trying to do is we're get, trying to get a composite picture based upon uh, certainly other data points. Uh, I would call those data points uh, the jobs data and then just general data to get a sense of what the overall economy is doing. So we had the ISM manufacturing data point that I mentioned before. Uh, we had the total vehicle sales number, ADP number. L the same day that the uh, ADP number came out, we did get a market composite number. Mm. Uh, and we also got the ISM non-manufacturing number. Uh, and then uh, yesterday, we also got uh, the jobless claims, and then today we got the uh, the jobs report. So all of those numbers, if you take them, uh, you can get a composite picture of what uh, what it looks like. And what I find, uh, just just uh, previewing what I'm about, about to say about the the next print, the all the numbers were relatively positive. Uh, so to me, the ADP number stands out as an aberration. Most of the other numbers were positive. I can talk a little bit about the jobs numbers that Haley talked about uh, at the top of the show as well. Yeah, give us a little more color on that. Yeah, so uh, back to Wednesday in terms of the ADP number, uh, the market composite PMI came in at 56.3. That's versus 54.3 prior, 55.5 was the, was the uh, expected. So it beat the expected and it was higher than the prior. This is the exact same thing that I said we got in, on Monday with regard to the ISM uh, manufacturing number. So what it says is, is, is that, you know, and this is a composite number, uh, the, serv the services PMI number was also the exact same pattern, 54.6, 56 for the uh, forecast, and then 56.9 for the actual. So we're, we're actually moving up, both in terms of composite manufacturing and in terms of services across the board 
in, uh, in these ISM surveys. 50, by the way, as you know, is the dividing line between contraction and uh, expansion. And 60 is kind of like a, a, a pilot on type of number. If you get a 60, it's just like gangbusters growth. So we're at the levels that is are good, but they're not really, you know, the gangbusters growth levels. And that's why I was talking about the reverse radical as a result of that. Right. You know, uh, obviously, these data points are obviously backward looking by definition. Uh, you're looking at October numbers here in November, not pricing in uh, or not accounting for, I should say, the future economic activity. How do you think about that against the backdrop that we have right now uh, of political uncertainty? Yeah, so I think that uh, political uncertainty and also the uh, the virus, those are the two things that yeah. uh, that could put a dent in it. So, you know, um, it, it, we, we still have a few other data points to go through, but let's just go forward in terms of, uh, you know, backward to coincident looking data versus forward looking data. I, some of these these uh, these uh, numbers, they have uh, sub indices in them that are somewhat forward looking and you can take a look and see about what's going to happen. So for instance, the ISM number, the non-manufacturing new orders number, it came in at 61.5 in, in September, but it was at 58.8 uh, uh, in, the, in the data points that we got on uh, Wednesday. So that tells you that actually uh, the future is not looking as good as the past. You look at uh, the ISM non-manufacturing employment number, it was 51.8. Now it's 50.1. So again, backpedaling. So a, a lot of this, uh, I would say a lot of this is like, uh, when you look at GDP, GDP is a production number, it's an output number. And so the current output levels are going up as a result of anticipation of continued growth. But some of the forward looking uh, numbers uh, are a little bit weaker. And they suggest that even if we don't have uh, political turmoil, even if we don't have the pandemic doing some damage, that there is a, a level of weakness that we should expect going forward relative to the numbers that we see today. Yeah, and I guess that sort of begets the question, and if we do, if there's existing weakness uh, and any of those things that you just discussed becomes a more significant factor, creating more drag on the economy, uh, does that suggest that we could sort of fall down to a lower plateau? Yeah. So, you know, again, going, you know, with this whole uh, zoom down, zoom up, you know, halfway and then the kink for the reverse radical, I think that that kink, it's really the, the slope of that line. Where, uh, you know, is it going to continue at a, a re relatively robust pace or is it going to start to soften? It seems like it's softening somewhat, but it's not softening yet at an alarming pace. Uh, and the forward-looking numbers are, are also saying that it's not necessarily softening at a hugely alarming pace. I'll give you an example from the last two data points that I would point out. Uh, you know, so you look at initial jobless claims that came out yesterday, 758 was the prior, 732 was expected, we got 751. You know, that's basically a push. 751, right. by the way, is a huge number. That's actually the, the highest number in any previous uh, recession that you would expect. So it says that even, you know, seven months into this process, uh, uh, eight months into uh, uh, post lockdown, we are still having, we're hemorrhaging 750,000 jobs a week. People, 750,000 people are losing their jobs. But overall, there's enough job growth that when the numbers came out uh, today, this morning, we still got a payroll number that was 638. And that 638 compares to a 672 number from the, the month prior. So, uh, you know, going back to th this down, up, and then kink, the kink is not rolling over considerably if you think about the, uh, the number of non firm payroll 672 to 638. Um, what I would say is, is, is that uh, the, you know, you, unemployment rate at 6.9%. Uh, when you also think about the uh, labor force participation rate uh, going up to 61.7 from 61.4, all of it says that if you had to just take a stop right now uh, and, and, and say, where are we? The answer is, is we're actually doing pretty well. There's still forward momentum in the U.S. economy as we speak right now. 
You know, you made an important point before, and I think for people who aren't uh, as well versed in macro as you are, Ed, it's a really crucial one. This idea of what you're talking about now uh, are effectively flow variables. It's the rate of replacement. But you said uh, that going at the current pace, we would still have three years worth of jobs to backfill. And really, the critical component, the most important overarching point to get is that this went straight down uh, and then came back up. And now you're talking about this flat period, this period of plateau in the data that's still below this top number up here. And so we still have uh, an impaired economy. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, the thing is, is that even if you have 3% growth, if you've, if you've done, gone down 30% and you've only gone up halfway or three, three quarters of the way up, you still have a way to go. And right. remember that in a normal economy, you would normally be growing anyway, let's say at 2%, uh, 3%. Right. So you have catch up to get back to the line that you were. So we're yeah. still way below where we want to be. We're below where we were in Q4 2019. We're below where we want to be, which is even higher than right. Q4 two, 2019 to be able to catch up. So while these numbers are uh, they're heartening, uh, we still have a long way to go. And And yeah. in terms of the three years of catch up, that's really the ADP number. If you looked at the uh, the payroll number that came out today, it's really more like 18 months, a month and a, a year and a half of catch up to get back to where we were uh, before the pandemic began. Yeah, and if we want to think about it in terms of the derivatives, uh, it's also the trend growth that you were talking about during uh, normal times of expansion is also on a higher base. So if you think about getting back to where you would be uh, had the path continued, it really is a long haul indeed. Yeah, and, and so uh, I think we have a long way to go. And the, the hope, therefore, is, is that we can get there uh, through self-sustained uh, economic growth. But we're now at a period where, as you rightly put it, uh, we have political uncertainty and we have uh, a degree of uh, pandemic uncertainty. And those two are coming as uh, some of the numbers are showing softness in terms of the anticipatory uh, numbers like uh, new orders uh, for the, the ISM that we saw uh, earlier in the week. Yeah. Now, I know you're watching these uh, uh, COVID pandemic numbers very closely as well. You know, when I look at them casually, obviously, I'm not a biostatistician, uh, but I look at them and I, I see two very different trends. Uh, the first is when I look at cases, and when I look at cases, uh, I see effectively three peaks, uh, one in, uh, I guess, in April, uh, and uh, a second in July. And then finally, uh, a third one that's peaking right now. It looks like every day we are getting significantly higher additional cases of COVID in the United States. Uh, I think the, the highest number that I heard was around uh, 126. Uh, and every day we're breaking new records. That obviously is a very alarming looking number. When I flip over to the mortality rate uh, from this, what I see is a very different story. There's a, a peak that's uh, that comes a little bit later than the peak on cases, which you would expect because it's lagged. Uh, and then uh, it goes down pretty dramatically, and then it begins to pick up and peaks again in late July, early August. Now, when you look at the slope of the line between August uh, and today, you basically see a very gentle roll down with a slight increase uh, over the last uh, over the last couple of weeks here, but the mortality rate uh, has reached. I shouldn't say rate. The total number of deaths has reached nowhere near uh, the number on a daily basis that we were at uh, during those earlier two peaks. And I I'm curious what your thoughts are about why that's happening. Uh, is that something to do with uh, increased rate of testing? Is the the virus becoming less virulent? Are we treating the disease better? What do you think is happening here? Well, you know, since I'm not an epidemiologist, I, whatever I say has no merit. But what I would say, just from a purely statistical perspective, is that uh, uh, we're not at the point yet where we were before. So just even uh, forgetting about uh, the lethality of, of it and how well we're prepared as to where we were before and the right. ability of testing to actually catch things earlier than you could before. We're not where we were before. Uh, however, the question is, is can we get there? Um, and if we could, how and why would that happen? Right. So when I look at the new case numbers going up 54%, and I see new death numbers going up 8%, that's the latest from a 14-day uh, rate of change that uh, the New York Times is reporting. The question is, is 
uh, what causes that 1108 number, which is a plus eight number, to go more towards the the, the uh, case count number? I think it's the the case count number continuing at the same level. You know, there's a catch up that's going to be played with regard to hospitalizations and with regard to deaths. So I would expect the eight percent number to go up um, to 10, uh, 15, 20 percent over time, and then we just have to see whether or not you know it is petered out by that time uh by that time we'll probably be into the thanksgiving season right. and then you know let's just see what happens but i i i honestly don't think that 1100 deaths per day is, a is a good number and then b is is where we're going to end up so where we were at 2000 uh at the peak before we're halfway more than halfway there it's very conceivable that we get up to fourteen or fifteen hundred by the end of this month. Yeah, those are very sobering words. Uh, you know, it also makes me wonder. Another area where you have really excelled is is thinking about and explaining the second order effects, the impact of the virus on the economy, uh, and the way that people change their behavior, which obviously affects uh, decisions uh, that have an economic impact. What's your thinking there with regard to this new rise in case count? Yeah, I, I'm keeping my, my mind open in terms of what it means uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, during the first wave, uh, what we saw was a uh, economic fright. That is, is that the consumers led the government. The shutdowns happened because uh, you know people wanted them to happen. Uh, the governments are generally reactive. So uh, you expected, uh, you know, people said this is a, a pandemic. We got to uh, uh, lock ourselves down in some capacity. We stopped movement and therefore the government did the lockdown. When you look at the data in terms of movement data, the movement data declined significantly before the lockdowns even happened. That's why the recession happened in February. That's the peak of the cycle as opposed to March when the actual lockdowns occurred. Right. Now, when you look at the the uh, you know the granular data, movement data, it's not anywhere near uh, what it was before. So even though you know we have massive numbers of new cases, 120,000, movement data suggests that people have acclimated their lives to uh, the virus in the way that it's it's performing now. So that it's not it's not necessarily the case that we're going to get a big hit uh, economically based upon uh, the death counts, hospitalization rates rising. We're not there at that point yet. None of the data say to me that we're at that point. And right. so it's speculative as to whether we'll get to that point or not. But the potential is definitely there. At some point, you know, hospitalizations and deaths rise enough that it's going to have a chilling effect. But we're not at that point at this at, at this juncture. So you take that in combination with what I was saying about the, the economy uh, before, it says that Europe is locking down and that's they're going to take a hit economically. The U.S. is not locking down. We're not going to take a hit economically yet. But the jury is still out. Yeah. It's interesting because you also suggest that the lockdowns, uh, if they don't come from without, they come from within. In other words, if the case counts rise dramatically and if the lethality of those cases increases, that people effectively lock themselves down, even if there isn't a government lockdown. Yeah, um, and, and I think that's definitely the case with the United States. I'd like to see what the movement data looks like in Europe, because obviously they've already locked down. Uh, it's not clear that it, the, the same thing works there, and uh, you know whether it's preemptive on the government's part or or not. But uh, in the U.S., that was that was certainly what we saw in February and March. Yeah. All right, Ed. We've avoided the elephant in the room for the last twenty minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, here we are on uh, Friday, November sixth. Still no outcome from the presidential election. The House race looks uh, relatively settled. Democrats minus six, uh, Republicans plus six. And it appears now that we're going to have a double runoff in the state of Georgia to determine not just uh, who represents uh, Georgia in the United States Senate, but also potentially which party controls the Senate. Uh, if Democrats win both of those seats, uh, it goes to 50-50. If Joe Biden is ultimately declared president, Kamala Harris as vice president will break the tie, giving Democrats control in the Senate. Obviously, a huge number of ifs there. On the presidential front, you know, 
from a purely politically neutral perspective, it seems pretty clear at this point that the arithmetic favors Vice President Biden to become the next president of the United States. So, yeah, the, the jury's still out as to whether, uh, you know, the legal, legal wrangling will continue. Because, you know, if you remember in 1876, Samuel Tilden, he had more votes, uh, many more than uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. But ultimately, he lost. And it wasn't just one state that was tested. Actually, it was multiple states contested. Back then, there was uh, a, a talk about fraud. And there actually was lots of actual fraud in terms of the electoral process. And uh, and so, you know, they uh, they worked out a deal. So it's not a done deal as yet right. um, in terms of whether or not uh, Biden is the president. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And yeah. it's also not a done deal in terms of whether the Senate is Democrat or Republican. Yeah. My view is that uh, it doesn't really matter uh, over the longer term because uh, economics drive the politics by and large. I, I don't see that uh, it may be over the short term, there's going to be some volatility. But over the longer term, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the dynamics of the uh, of the economy are not going to be driven by what happens uh, in terms of the election. Well, you know, you're exactly right on what you said before. Anything can happen. Uh, I was very careful in the way I phrased it. Arithmetic favors uh, Joe, Joe Biden to be the next president. That's certainly by no means certain. Anything can happen in two runoffs. Um, but, you know, I guess now it is a question of what happens with the legal wrangling and what happens with the political wrangling. By the way, 269, 269 for electoral uh, deadlock is not a likely scenario, but it's not impossible. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. I don't know why they didn't do 539. Maybe there's a way to have like 539 so that no matter what happens, someone wins. There's never yeah. a possibility of a, of a deadlock. Well, I think it's constitutionally mandated by the number of, uh, how, of representatives in the House of Representatives plus the number of senators. So it's sort of statistically uh, based on census data, uh, and it's it's sort of hardwired into the Constitution. It would make a lot more sense uh, to have an odd number. Yeah, definitely. I think that would uh, that would uh, make things a lot easier. Yeah, the party but, uh, who is in control in the House gets plus one vote in the event that it's an even number, and you're done. Yeah. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this works out. I think, uh, as I said before, it, it would be interesting to see what uh, Tony says. He's a trader. He has a definitely a different view or he had a different view of uh, what the markets were saying beforehand. I'd like to see what he has to say now that uh, we've actually gotten uh, the results. But, uh, yeah. you know, from an investment, a longer term investment perspective, I think the only uh, real um, uh, bogey that I would have is with regard to the runoff going both Democrat and uh, Joe Biden becoming the president, because right. that would, irrespective of whether or not it's just eking by, it would be a blue wave. It would be everything in the, the Democrats' favor. And that's a completely different scenario right. than divided government. I, right. And I think that the markets would react to that. Uh, whether they react positively or negatively, both on the bond and the equity side, I can't say. But right. to me, that's the only situation that we should be thinking about as having longer term implications. Yeah. And the important point is it's a significant change. Whichever direction it goes in, whichever direction it prices in, you would then have uh, the continued control of the House by the Democrats, uh, Senate and presidency, which one might think would lead to an increase uh, in fiscal stimulus on a scale that we have not seen yet. Yeah. So uh, what I would say is is that there still is a claim to be made that volatility can spike between now and January the 20th. Uh, volatility came down, uh, but I think that uh, it's not going to continue to come down. I think it's going to remain relatively elevated and there might there may be periods of spike. So if you want to trade the volatility, that may be the, the way to go, irrespective of the direction of the market. Yeah. Ed, final question. It looks like you may have raided my closet today. You're wearing the tight check shirt, and I'm wearing the solid. Yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to fit in. <laughs> well done, Ed Harrison. Thanks for joining us. Have a good long weekend. Yeah, everyone have a good weekend. Try and stay off Facebook. <laughs>